Well, Abby, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Really appreciate your time. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's a huge privilege. Yeah, of course. And yeah, there's a lot I want to talk about with you because I think, you know, you have Superfluid, which is your, your newsletter and you talk about a lot of amazing kind of investing frameworks and it's a great resource for founders and kind of sharing your learnings as an investor. So really keen to dive into some of that. But I guess as a starting point, we'd love to just kind of understand a bit of your background and your story. It sounds like you've always kind of been into business and entrepreneurship. I saw you had a tutoring company that you started <laughs> in 2015. Maybe you could just tell us a bit about your background. Yeah, for sure. You've definitely stalked my LinkedIn, which is good. So I guess my interest in in tech sort of stems from my parents. Both my parents used to work at Sun Microsystems when I was quite young. We lived in Silicon Valley for a couple of years. Not saying that I, I got into tech back then when I was like three, but definitely as I was growing up, sort of through primary school, very interested in playing around with computers, games, that sort of stuff through high school got more interested in the business side of, of tech. And so I would read TechCrunch all the time and sort of got introduced to investing in my year eight commerce class, played the ASX stock market game, understood sort of the world of equity markets and all of that stuff. And sort of, yeah, like birthed a new interest in, in investing and that sort of continued till now. I'm someone who like my interests vary from time to time and it's very hard to keep me focused on one one single thing, but investing in tech have been the two things in my life that have just stayed around. And so in university, I started studying actuarial studies. I thought that was like an interesting pathway to get into investing. Very important to understand risk and, and, and the relationship between risk and return. Unfortunately, that degree is very theoretical and very in-depth on the statistics side. And I just got very bored honestly. And so I ended up started finishing off with the Bachelor of Applied Finance at Macquarie University. And the the done thing when I graduated in mid-2018, all my friends were sort of going into corporate jobs. And I was like, well, this tech and, uh, tech and startup stuff is actually quite interesting. But back then, there wasn't really a pathway for grads to get involved. I think it was just very much emerging and, and I didn't really have the foresight or friends in the area who, who were interested in that stuff. And so I went down the corporate pathway. I worked for a company called Cambridge Associates where I sort of consulted for super funds, family offices, pension funds, endowments on how they're constructing their portfolios. And so that was a really interesting role in the sense that I got to work with, you know, multi-billion dollar portfolios and, and understanding asset the asset management landscape across all asset classes was fascinating. But mostly I got got good exposure to a lot of the early Aussie VCs. So Blackbird, SquarePeg, Airtree, the partners at those funds would come and pitch us and want our clients money and and we would give it to them and that that was a really interesting insight into how the tech ecosystem in in australia was evolving over time and so i was in that role for about two and a half years towards the end of that i was getting very disillusioned with the corporate pathway it wasn't the most engaging role either it was a very like stock standard stable role and like i said i get distracted quite easily unfortunately mm. and so i left that I went and sort of DM'd maybe 50, 60 founders on LinkedIn and I was like, hey, I really want an internship at your company. I'm really passionate about X, Y, Z and was quite selective about the people that I reached out to. They're all sort of that pre-seed, seed stage, but also problem uh, like solving problems that I was really passionate about. And so in the end, I ended up working as an intern at a company called Upstreet. And unfortunately, they've sort of closed their doors now, but at the time, they were, a, I guess, a fractional shares app and combined with like a loyalty marketplace. And so the premise was every time you sort of shop at Woolworths or any other store, you get fractional stock back in the businesses that you're shopping with. And it was a really interesting way to get people into the stock market and, under and improving their financial literacy. And that's something that I'm quite passionate about. And so did that for about six months. And through that time, sort of was getting more involved in the tech ecosystem, actually building proper connections. And eventually a role at Folklore Ventures sort of popped up, jumped at that one, was there for a year and a half. And now I work at Rampersand, which is an early stage fund based out of Sydney and Melbourne. We're sort of deploying our fourth fund at the moment. We've got some interesting winners in our portfolio, including Scheduler, Jigspace, GoTerra, to sort of name a couple. And yeah, I work as an associate here. We're a team of eight. We've got six investors in the team. And so, yeah, it's been an awesome, awesome journey in VC for the last two and a half years. And I can't really see myself doing anything else. 
That's awesome, man. I'm curious because you kind of got those both sides of the table experience operating and then also now investing and you kind of jump between the two. Was it just like clear to you that the investing was more where your kind of strengths or interests lie as opposed to operating or how did you kind of decide between the two? Yeah, like it, it's, a, it's a good question. And at the time, I didn't know if I'd really like operating when I first got into it. I say I was an intern, but I was managing other interns. Like... <laughs> It was a bit of a funny role. I had like a to-do list that was maybe like 70 to 100 things long. So working with really talented people. And so it was quite fascinating from an internship, internship perspective what I was doing. And I guess it was a real debate in my mind whether I'd really like the investing side of things. And I sort of had to think back, you know, like the, like I said before, the one thing that stayed constant in my life is my love for tech and my love for investing. And when that opportunity came up, it was hard to say no. The operating side is really, really hard. And I was working like 100 hour weeks, you know, and like the investing side is hard as well, but it's- Different type of hard. It's a different type of hard and it's something that I really enjoy. And so it doesn't feel as hard Mm. as it was. There are times where it's definitely hard, but operating, you're sort of literally just walking on glass, like 24 seven. Yeah. yeah, like huge amounts of respect to founders and operators out there. Yeah, but I'm sure it definitely helps as well with your investing, having that experience and that empathy of, of what founders are doing. Yeah, so. a little bit because Upstreet was one, a consumer app, two, a fintech, and three, a marketplace. That's like the worst combination you could have. It's the hardest thing you can scale. You've got to have B2B sales conversations. You've got to do cost- consumer customer acquisition. It's l- quite literally they picked the three hardest areas that you could build a business in and they combined it and it was pretty it's pretty rough. <laughs> but it's, it's really interesting as well we said around, because again, I'm sure you still work very hard today in your investing role, but like you said, because it's kind of more aligned, I guess, to your skill sets or what you really care about or what you're naturally good at and you're sort of building on that, It's it just kind of flows a bit better. And I think that is an important thing for people to understand as well is that like, just because you're grinding yourself into the dirt doesn't mean like you're achieving like exactly what you want. So it's good to be mindful of like, where are your natural strengths? What do you want to do? And then just like a, putting that in the right vehicle because then you can work extremely hard, but yeah. it just kind of flows. Yeah, absolutely. So. I think it's an interesting one with investing. Like I said, it's a passion of mine and, and sort of the things that I was doing for fun before are now constituted as work. Hmm. So sort of reading articles, reading books, creating content and all of that stuff is work now. Hmm. And so when I first entered the VC world, I was like, this is amazing. I'm getting paid to do things that I do for fun. Mm. And quite quickly, I was doing the same 100 hour weeks and it all felt fun. Mm. But at the end of the day, you just need to take a break at times. And and I got quite quickly burnt out. Maybe like three months in, I was like, oh God, like I'm, I'm like where I really, really wanted to be. But why do I feel so tired and why do I feel exhausted all the time? And like, Mm. I think that was a symbol of burnout. VC investing is very much, there are sprints, but in the long run, it is a marathon. So you have to pace Mm. yourself. There's always something you could be doing. Mm. And if you do everything, it's going to be really, really hard to actually complete the marathon at the end of the day. And so that that was like a key, key learning early days. So it's fun. It's exciting, but you just need to take a break sometimes. Yeah. And realize that it is, you know, a 10 or multi-decade kind of journey yeah, so literally. how do you make sure you're still alive after 10 years <laughs> yeah exactly like yeah. i honestly want to do this till i die and hopefully that's in 100 years time and so if i want to if i want to survive till then like you just kind of have Go to like to face it yeah yeah cool man well yeah one thing i'm really interested in in talking a bit about because obviously you've created a lot of great content i mean you've been doing it for for a few years but more recently you've kind of really narrowed down on with your super fluid surround specifically fundraising for founders and sort of been a bit of a, a guide into the what is sometimes a murky world of navigating uh, venture as a founder so yeah there's obviously a lot of stuff and we'll obviously link to that so people can go and check out your post in full but i was really keen to just kind of talk to you and kind of unpack a bit of what you wrote about because i think it's just a fascinating and really useful resource for founders especially around you know a lot of founders listen to this podcast they might be thinking about is should I raise for my company? How do I go about that if I want to do it? So we'd love to understand from your point, like, you know, especially at that super early stage where a founder, like maybe this is the first time they've raised capital. It's the first time they've raised for this company specifically. You know, what are some of those first points that founders need to actually think about of whether they should actually go down this fundraising path? What are the first things that founders need to think about? Yeah, for sure. Well, firstly, thank you for the kind words around super fluid. I never know what to say when someone says, that they like to read it and that it's exciting because in my mind when I write those 
articles, no one's reading it at the other end. And so it's it's nice to hear that. I think sort of I'll sort of talk about why I write those articles first and I'll give you an insight in terms of like why they're structured that way, what my goal is and and what I think is really important for founders, especially at that early stage, um, to note and to hear and to sort of internalize. And so when I first started writing, I was writing to learn for myself. It was very much compounding the learnings that I was having in VC. And it was like, there's a lot of intellectual stimulus in VC. And so you've got to write notes. And I'm, I've never written notes in my life. And now I am. And so initially started off that way. And now it's very much like, okay, I've got all of these learnings. Now I have to share back with people. Like that's the purpose that I have in my heart. I feel that. And so the fundraising advice that I've written so far is something that I've, like they're learnings that I've had over the last couple of years. And the last couple of years have been interesting as a VC. In 2021, fundraisers were getting closed in a couple of days. 2023, fundraisers are taking six months or more or not even closing at all. And so when you have so much uncertainty, when you're building your startup, you know, things around customers, product, all of that stuff. Fundraising is something that is seen as a chore by a lot of founders. And I think rightly so. Founders aren't here to be begging for money, unfortunately. But sometimes that that is the case. And founders think of it like that as well. And I don't necessarily think that should be the mindset that they take. I think fundraising should give you the clarity about the type of business you're building. And it's actually an important process. It, It... It's sort of like, I think, a reflective process of what you've built and where you're going as well. And I think it's actually quite a strategic sort of thing that you could be doing with your business is just understanding, one, why you actually need to raise funds and two, think about the quality of your business, right? Mm -hmm. And it's just such a confusing thing for founders to see, you know, XYZ startup raised 30 million bucks and maybe you're building something similar and you're like, well... I'm building a product that's way better than that one. Why can't I raise 30 million bucks? Unfortunately, this world isn't as binary as you'd hope it to be. And there is a lot of uncertainty. And so the content that I write is trying to cut through that uncertainty, give people frameworks to apply, give people processes to sort of follow and hopefully increase the chances of actually raising around because it's quite literally maybe one of the hardest things you'll have to do especially as a pre-seed or seed founder, trying to convince people that your non-consensus idea, your controversial idea is actually worth funding. Yeah. Yeah, it's it really is. And again, it's eye-opening to see that process of like how much of a grind it actually can be. And I think it's, to be frank, like a shock for a lot of founders, especially if they've never done it before, because, you know, they think they might be able to come in and be like, cool, I've got this great idea. We've got a great team. Let's settle this and then just start executing but like you said you know it can take even for we've seen even for great founders who have a track record and like sold their company for tens of millions of dollars previously like it still takes like three or six months to kind of close out around and they get a lot of no's so i think it's definitely extremely important to kind of know what that process is going to look like and be able to navigate it which is where you're sort of coming in with your content which is great absolutely and i think you know if you haven't fundraised before or even if you have every company's fundraising journey is different There's nuances to all of it. And for a lot of pre-seed seed seed founders, there are small improvements or small hacks or small things that you can do to actually just like accelerate the process, but also increase your chances of raising success. And that's what I try and share with my audience. It's it's sort of the small like one percenters that are actually have outsized impact on your on your chances of raising around. Yeah. Absolutely. And you do a lot of that. So let's maybe go through a few of those points. So I guess as a starting point, you know, like what is what does a founder actually need to think about when they're considering fundraising as to whether they should go down that path? What is the first kind of thing they should think about? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think with VC fund fundraising, you need to consider what you're using the capital for. So there are some businesses that will be cash flow positive from day one. You will have really, really strong unit economics but maybe the market isn't so big or maybe you can't hyperscale the business, the product or whatever it is, right? In those cases, it's just much better to stay bootstrapped because as soon as you try and force a market to grow faster than it actually is growing or you try and force your own your own business to scale faster than it should be growing, that's when you just tank everything. Mm. You will blow up your company if you do that. So that's like one thing. That's why you shouldn't take VC funding. On the flip side, you should take VC funding if one, if it's going to be like 
semi-capital in intensive or there is a clear use case for the funds more than just building a product more than just hiring a team it's like no this funding will allow us to accelerate the things that we're already doing and we will deploy that capital in a responsible way to sort of grow whatever we're doing so effectively pouring fuel on a fire that's how you should think about it if you can conceivably do that in a responsible manner go ahead and raise capital and it doesn't mean that you're a great business if you've raised vc capital because like i said you can torch it quite easily you can burn out quite easily and you can take a good cash flow positive business that will lead to a really strong exit for you as a founder and blow it up if you take vc capital and that's a risk that not a lot of people are talking about but i feel like people know i'm not really sure but it's very obvious to me and that's mm. just what I want to tell people. It's like, you have to, there are certain businesses that are, you know, built to be VC funded businesses. Things like a milk run. You need a lot of capital to go after that market to really scale quickly. It's a massive, massive market, massive opportunity. And you need to raise a lot of money. And so they raised a ton of money and they had a good crack at it. Mm. Unfortunately, it didn't work and that's life. Mm. But if you sort of, you know, if you're sort of building maybe an e-commerce store selling creams or something like that, you can actually bootstrap that business really, really well. You don't need to raise VC money mm -hmm. for that. And you'll just own a lot more of the equity in that business. And maybe you exit it out. But if you raise VC money, you'll just always be reliant on a capital source that isn't actually always going to be there, especially yeah. when times are getting tough. And we're seeing that now. People aren't funding these businesses because the unit economics suck or they've built their business around fundraising every two years. Yeah. And, and that's just like unfortunate for a lot of people where they could have had a really good business for themselves, but they took on the capital and no one advised them otherwise. And they unfortunately have screwed up a really awesome opportunity. And mm. that hurts for me, which is yeah. why I don't want people to follow, f fall down that path. Yeah. You're so right. There's a very specific kind of type of business or business model or capital requirements where someone should take on, on venture funding. And I guess like one... One term that gets like thrown around a lot is like this idea of like something being venture scale. So I guess I'd be curious, like from your perspective, what does what does that mean to you? So like, if a founder is thinking like, is my business venture scale? Should I take on capital? Mm. What does that actually mean? Yeah, it's a good question. And the default answer here that a lot of people will give or think about is very much to be venture scale, you have to be building in a massive, massive market, like multi-billion dollar market. Because if you take like a percentage of that market, you can be a billion dollar business, et cetera, et cetera. I think about it in a different way. One, like that first way, nothing wrong with that. That's fine. But it means that you'll miss non-obvious opportunities. And so what you really need to think about it is the market size in the context of the business or the product or the business model, right? And so it's sort of like, is this product or does this product have the potential to grow the market size exponentially, mm -hmm. to push into other markets, to build other me uh, defensibility mechanics. And if so, then you can gain comfort over its ability to be venture scale. It's such a subjective thing. People think about this in a different way. No one will give you the same answer. Mm -hmm. And my answer will be different to another person's answer, right? And maybe I'm wrong, maybe they're wrong. Who knows, maybe we're all wrong. Yeah, but I guess like to boil it down, it's kind of like this idea that there needs to be a certain potential financial outcome for the investor, for the venture investor from that company. And for that to be the case, either the market has to be massive, like you said, or like you said, secondly, is that they need to actually, there needs to be a path for them to tangibly actually expand that market through their company and their yeah, offering. Yeah, like expand the market through the offering or there are strong tailwinds sort of pushing that market forward and expanding it. And you're sort of riding on the coattails of that. Mm. Like that's a great place to be as well. Yeah. But yeah, like it's all in the, like, Framing all of that happens in the context of the VC fund you're speaking to. Mm -hmm. So another very underrated thing is some funds are small, some funds are big, some funds are like medium size. Small funds, call it maybe 10 to 30 million bucks, medium size sort of 30 to 100, 150, something like that. And big sort of on the top end of town, like your 500, 600 million dollar funds, right? Or billion dollar in the case of Blackbird. The return targets for all of those funds are so wildly different. For a seed focused fund, your goal is to basically return the fund. So call it 20 million bucks, 40 million bucks from one investment. That's the goal. And the return hurdle or the 
threshold or the target for how big a business needs to be scales up and down based on the fund size. And so a billion dollar company for a $20 million fund is amazing, but a billion dollar company for a billion dollar fund, not really that exciting because the investor won't own 100% of that billion dollar company. They might own 10, 15, 20, or even less, five, Mm. right? And like, that's not entirely that exciting to them. For a billion dollar fund, you probably need a $10 billion outcome, right? To actually be that exciting. Yeah, so like you said, it really depends on a number of factors, both from the fund fund size and mandates and there's a lot to it. There's a lot to unpack and like this is what creates uncertainty, Mm -hmm. right? Like everyone has different requirements, restrictions, thoughts, blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of uncertainty there, which is why it's important that people don't cover their content in marketing fluff. Mm -hmm. That's something that I actively try not to do is like, I want to be direct. Like, When I write my articles, it's very much like I'm talking to a friend Mm -hmm. and guiding them how I, you know, like uh, my own portfolio company founders. Yes, that's very much how it comes across. Because like you said, I think there's like content from like other people I've read or other like funds where it's very much like saying all the right things and, you know, like we're like super founder friendly or like we want to do X, Y, Z or whatever, but there's not actually any like tangible, useful kind of information in this. I think that's a really big difference about what you're doing and so i guess off the back of that like i really would love to kind of understand your perspective on let's so let's say we have a founder they've kind of looked at their business they're like yeah cool i believe it's venture scale i believe it's the kind of business that can benefit from taking on venture capital but now i need to actually go through the fundraise and so i guess what are the first things the founders need to think about when they're looking to actually go through that fundraising process there's a there's a few things and i kind of like to think about this as founders doing their homework before they actually kick off a raise Because what I find is a lot of founders will sort of put their idea down on a pitch deck. It's a PowerPoint. It either looks good or it doesn't. And they'll just reach out to investors that they know. And this is like a pretty logical approach, right? Like kind of trying to get any money you can and you go to the people that you know. I think you can be a lot more strategic about that entire process. One, crafting the pitch deck actually takes a lot of thought. It isn't just following Sequoia or YC's like template right like there is no template approach to a pitch deck you need to think about this you need to think about how you're communicating the story of your startup like no movie is the same as another one right no book is the same as another one so why should your pitch deck be the same as like airbnbs like that's just such a nonsensical approach in my opinion but a lot of people follow it and that's like fine right but yeah i think like you need to take a bespoke approach to creating your pitch deck and so how do you i guess on that how do you think about that because again there's many like pitch tip templates or like problem solution market, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, of course. So how do you, how does that founder, I guess, work out what is the best way to kind of tailor this story? So you need to sort of think about what will convince people. And at the pre-seed and seed stage, it's going to be largely around the market. Is this market big? Like we sort of spoke about, is it a venture scale market? Is it growing fast, et cetera, et cetera. And then from then on, it's more so like, in the context of that market or in the context of that opportunity what are you building how are you taking advantage of these tailwinds how are you accessing this large market and so it's sort of structuring a story based off that and so always starts with context you've got to set the context up front and then you can go into either product business model or better yet show proof in the traction that you have that you are actually taking advantage of those tailwinds and you are doing something really really interesting but it sort of all flows from context and a lot of people sort of pass over that context and it's clear to see why they pass over it it's because the founders are domain experts right the context to them is actually quite clear but as a vc who sort of sees maybe 20 to 50 pitch decks a week the context isn't clear like Mm -hmm. i actually don't know everything about every market in the world So I need to be educated or I need to be told what the opportunity actually is and why it's an interesting opportunity. So I think like that introductory sort of piece is actually quite important and one that a lot of founders sort of gloss over. They sort of go straight to this is the product, this is our team, we're really well credentialed, we are the right founders to build this. But it's actually setting the context up front, which is actually quite important. Yeah, because it's like, that can be true, but then it's like, why Why is this even important in the first place if you haven't set that context? Exactly. Um, it's like, like everything stems from context. Like mm-hmm. the fact that you're the right team to build this, again, stems from context. Like, why are you the right team to build this? I need to understand the context first. Why this product? Why this business model? Why are you launching in this market? Things like that mm-hmm. all matter. Is there a way to actually, I guess, like uh, for a founder to think about that in terms of, 
don't want to say dumbing it down, but because like you said, like investors, they see, like you said, like 50 pitch decks a week, different markets, different opportunities. They, you almost need to kind of communicate to them or like put it in the simplest terms possible where that investor can like look at a few slides and just be like, yeah. okay, cool. I understand that context. Yeah. Like, how do you kind of suggest the founders really do that? I think it's kind of like a explain like I'm five, like explain it in simple terms. And if you can do that, I think that's really interesting because that actually just showcases a quality that the founders have, that they're able to sort of take something really, really complex and explain it simply such that it makes sense for someone who doesn't really ha have too much prior knowledge, right? Like that's an interesting skill set or attribute to have as a founder. But two, it just helps the VC accelerate their own process and come to grips and understand what's actually being said or what, what's being portrayed and things mm -hmm. like that. So I think it's very much like, I mean, the easiest way to do this is literally put in your, put in what you know, put in a data dump into ChatGBT and just go, can you consolidate this into a, an explain like a five type <laughs> format or framework or whatever it is, right? Just do that and then craft it from there, build it back up. I like that. Very, very good way to go about it. So I guess, is it fair to say, I mean, I'd love to hear if you have any other points to add, but it sounds like for that kind of initial fundraise, like the most important things to convey to the investors is first of all context in a way that's easy for them to understand and like showing that this is a market opportunity that has potential to be venture scale and that you're the right person and team to kind of do that is there any other like really important key points that an investor is going to look for that the founders should hit on there'll be things like your product road what your growth forecasts are like what I, I think the other thing here is like understanding how much money you should raise and what you're going to do with that money. A lot of founders sort of come in and say, hey, I want to raise anywhere from one to two million bucks to just grow this business. It's not entirely that specific. One to two is actually a pretty big difference in quantum. You can do things with two million bucks that you can't do with one. And it might like understanding the intricacies of how you're going to spend your money is really, really important. And it's not so that we'll sort of be there with a whip and sort of whip you if you spend a cent more. It's more so to understand whether you've actually thought about how you're going to deploy the capital. So what a lot of founders sort of do with fundraising is very much optimized to raise just enough. It's like, yeah, I just need a million dollars, right? Actually, if they raise two, it gives them a lot of leeway. You're not meant to spend the entire two. It's mm -hmm. more so like maybe you do spend the one, but you've got another one left over in case of, you know, a pivot or in mm -hmm. case something takes longer than it's, it's meant to take, things like that. Because forecasting is just like your best guess, right? So it's important to have that buffer room when you're fundraising. So raise more than you actually need. You will take on early dilution. That's just the cost of capital if you don't have anything else, right? Like yeah. it's better it's better to take on that early dilution and like lower that over time. Like take that 20, 25% dilution early. It's gonna be expensive, seed capital is expensive unfortunately and then maybe at the next round you have hit higher targets than you were expecting and so you can take 10 percent dilution 15 percent dilution and it'll what it'll wash out over time right it's funny on that do you, do you think that sometimes it's easier to raise more money than than less because i think like some founders kind of like you said they're like i just need like 100k or whatever and they like think very small but sometimes i feel like investors they want to see like ambition and they want to see like a big kind of goal like what do you think about that yeah i i think you're absolutely right it's it's, it's a weird dichotomy right and it largely goes down to that ambition piece but also fund size mm -hmm. like a million dollar investment out of a 500 million dollar fund is not entirely that interesting for that fund mm -hmm. right like that means they have to do 500 separate investments if they were just doing a mill 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 right and so partly in their interest it's like yeah we do have to do investments of two three four whatever it is and for some funds you know like it might be easier or there is an opportunity for founders who want to raise less to sort of work with smaller funds right the the caveat here is from a fund perspective always trying to optimize how many investments you're making and how you can maximize your returns and for the big funds for them it's writing big checks that's mm -hmm. the business they're they're in and for uh, and like i think the companies that they choose are sometimes good companies that take checks that are way 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 too big mm -hmm. like i know i said you should raise more but there is a limit to how much you're raising and some of the companies that they fund have massive massive ambition kind of like a milk run right and so again there's a lot of, it like, it's hard, it's hard to prescribe rules to this stuff. It is dependent on the business you're building, your capital requirement, and 
and sort of the funds who you work with will be dictated by that. Yeah. Like, you know, the big funds with, are not always the best capital partner for every business. They're a strong capital partner for certain businesses. Smaller funds, good capital partners for other businesses. It's mm-hmm. more about figuring out what type of business you are rather than just copying the journey of someone else. Yeah, super interesting. And yeah, everyone is bespoke, but it, it is good to, I guess, have these like high-level frameworks of how to think about things and then you kind of tailor it to, to your own situation. But I guess, so, okay, so a founder... They've sort of looked at their business. They realize it's venture scale. They want to go down that path. They've crafted their story, mm-hmm. kind of put together their pitch deck. Mm-hmm. How do you actually now go about like sequencing your raise and going through that? Yeah, it's a good question. And this is where a lot of founders sort of leave. So like I said before, the first thing is like, oh, I know three investors at XYZ Fund. Let me ping them my deck and try and get a meeting that way. That's like the obvious approach. I think you can actually be a lot more intricate about it and use the fundraising process to your own benefit. To one, learn more about your own business so there's business and maybe the risk present with that business, but also to to craft your story and actually iterate on. Similar to how you would sort of build a product, you need to do like customer validation in some respect or figure out what the common objections are, right? And so I think when you're sort of sequencing your raise, the first step is one, like it's coming up with a list of maybe a hundred investors and actually just like sitting through and figuring out which ones are actually the right ones for you. So whether that's a fun size thing, whether that's a industry experience thing, a whole bunch of stuff, right? Like portfolio value add, et cetera, et cetera. And ranking that in, in, in different tiers. And and I've written an article about this that will be a lot more specific than I am now. But it's sort of ranking that into different tiers. You've sort of got four tiers. Your tier one investors are the ones that you really want to work with. They're not the ones that are the biggest or the smallest or whatever it is. It's the ones that you actually want on your cap table. Two and three sort of are like, they're your second, third chance. And tier four are sort of the investors that just aren't a great fit for whatever you're building. Maybe they're sort of not really sector specialists in in the area that you're building or they sort of focus on something else, et cetera, et cetera. But the goal with those tier four investors is very much to, and and it's not a slide on them. They could be great investors for other businesses. It's not tier four in quality, right? It's tier four in fit to you. As a, as a founder. And the goal for talking to those tier four investors might feel like a waste of time, but it's very much to pull out the early questions that VCs will ask you. What are those like first meeting questions that will come up and how can you tailor your pitch deck such that those questions don't come up and you can go straight into the nitty gritty with your tier one, tier two investors. Like we're trying to increase this velocity of this fundraise. We're trying to increase the probability of this fundraise. And so the more practice you've had and the more you're able to sort of preempt questions or think about things in a different way because of the past experience that you've had, the better you'll be when you're pitching your tier one, tier two investors, the investors you actually want on your cap table. Mm -hmm. So it's very much an iterative approach. And and in the article that I've written, there's there's a full like eight week sequencing pattern that you can follow, right? Mm -hmm. And it won't follow that specifically but it is like a good structure to follow, I think. Yeah, so interesting because like you said, I feel like sometimes in the founder's mind that the most logical way to approach it is like you said, oh, I know these investors, they're going to be kind of like friendly towards me. I really want them. So let's go to them first. But then, like you said, you haven't kind of had that practice, haven't iterated and refined your story and your pitch. And so it's actually probably the worst thing you could do. And so sequencing in that way, which... Again, we'll link up uh, that article because I thought it was really great. But just like having that kind of those different buckets and then very methodically kind of working your way through them in reverse order yeah. um, is the best way to go. About. It's, a, it's a structured approach and it can feel slow at times, I think, for people who follow it. But I think it's very, very important to do it that way just because you'll learn so much about your business. I think investors think about different things in like as an example, you might be building a company doing who knows what. But an investor would have seen 10 iterations of that over the last six months already, mm. right? And you might be the you might be someone who thinks you're the only one doing it. It's an untapped opportunity, blah, blah, blah. But the investor has seen 10 similar companies. And so they can tell you about that. They can tell you about what they like, what they didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. Mm. That's really important. And I guess I'd be curious to know what you think. What are great questions that founders can actually ask investors? Because similar to even like a job interview, like, you know, it's your interviewing if you're interviewing for a job, you're interviewing the company as much as they're interviewing you. Yeah. You same with fundraising. Oftentimes, you're kind of interviewing the investors as much as they're interviewing you. And so, if you're a founder, kind of talking to investors, what are the main sort of questions that you should ask them to see if 
they're a good fit as an investor as well. Yeah, there, the, it's an interesting one. There is like a B2B sales element for all of this stuff that I think as a founder, you should be qualifying each investor as you sort of talk to them. So when I say qualifying, it's like qualifying investor fit to founder fit or investor fit to company, that sort of thing. So thinking around things like, you know, a lot of founders sort of see a fund that might have made investments in their industry. And they're kind of like, oh yeah, they've made a lot of investments in that industry. They're the best fund. They're the best fund for us. Sometimes those investments might not have gone that well. And the fund might actually be quite turned off by investing in that industry. Mm -hmm. But as a founder, you're quite excited by the prospect that they might fund you. And so it's like understanding what went well, what went wrong for those investments, what they liked, what they didn't like, et cetera, et cetera. I think that's really interesting and like figuring out what they think, what their thesis is and all of that. So I think that's like a big part. But then it's also understanding who the investor is that you're talking to and like understanding what motivates them, understanding what they're excited by, what they see in your business. You basically want to see whether they'll invest in you and leave you alone or whether they'll invest in you and lean in further. And a lot of founders think that investors should stay far away from a business. I think that's like the wrong mentality to have. And like the best founders are actually ones who actively seek out advice and investor opinion. Maybe they listen to it and maybe they don't, but they don't want yes people around the table mm. they actually want someone who can actively challenge their decisions because that's how you grow as a person someone challenges you someone poses something different in a way that you haven't considered before whereas if you have yes people around your table it's very very hard to actually be challenged very hard to grow mm. and you'll just keep doing things in a way that you think is right but actually might not be right and like i'm not saying investor advice is going to be perfect we don't have as much context as you but it can be valuable at times it's a different perspective or oftentimes they're looking at the business in a different way or might see things that you're not really thinking about. Exactly. It's a zoomed out view. It's a top down view. And like if you're in the weeds, you can miss things with your company, mm -hmm. how you're hiring, how you're structuring the business and all of that stuff. Right. So it's worthwhile talking and chatting to a lot of people. And You pick and choose what you want to what you want to follow and all of that stuff. But I think it's you want investors who are willing to lean in, willing to give their time, willing to give their advice and like. Those are their investors who, in a time of crises, will actually stand by you and help you out. If from day zero, an investor doesn't necessarily get involved, it might not be a red flag then. It more matters how they react when you're in trouble. If they lean in when you're in trouble, I think that's fine. If they don't lean in at that point, that's really hard. Because then, as a founder, you're just going to feel alone. And that's not a great place to be, yes. in my opinion. Yeah, that's where you want want the help the most and you don't get it exactly and so i guess sort of off the back of that as well is how do you so how do found, how should founders think about i guess their cap table in general at that early stage because again i think sometimes the mindset that founders have especially if it's their first time fundraising is it's like all we need to do is we need to secure investment yep. and that's like the laser focus and then it's like cool we got a term sheet let's go and that's all they think about but again that can kind of come back to bite you in the future potentially if you kind of mess yep. up your cap table so i guess yeah what should kind of founders be thinking about at that early stage yeah it's a it's a really good question so i think again important to note that circumstances will vary there are caveats to this but i think clean term sheets are really really important to accept at the early stage because you don't want structure in the deals that you're accepting right and when i say structure it's things like maybe a 2x liquidation pref or a full ratchet anti-dilution clause things like that will provide precedent for later round investors to just keep doing the same thing and two in when times are bad those instruments or structure is very much to protect the investor not you as a founder. And you have to remember as a founder, you if you're doing really, really well, you will have some protection for future rounds because things like founder resub top ups happen all the time. And so if your equity holding dwindles, later round investors will be more willing to sort of top up the founder. Whereas if you're doing poorly, the liquidation preference will just hurt you incredibly and you won't see a cent from the business that you've built but your equity your, like your equity stake at that time won't even matter so it's like if you've maximized equity stake and sort of given up a little bit on the lick pref then you're probably not in a great position if the company is doing poorly right so it's always like a balance between everything um but i think clean terms no like overhang 
from a structure perspective is really, really important. And then the other thing to note is very much, you know, choosing the right investors who will support you, you know, for a couple rounds at least, or through advice, through connections, all of that stuff is very, very important. At the moment, we're seeing a lot of predatory term sheets sort of out there and maybe not from the best investors. Like it could just be like, a, you know, someone who's seen an opportunity and trying to take advantage of it. And a lot of companies are taking on those terms because they have to survive. And at some point in time, one, you have to think about whether the journey is still worth going on or two, does it actually make sense to bundle the company and actually take the IP and start again with the fresh cap table? Like that's an approach that I don't think a lot of people necessarily do, but a fairly valid one. Concern there is very much around, can you raise more money for this idea and at that point you sort of have to think about whether the idea is actually as valuable as you think it is or Mm -hmm. whether the market is there Mm -hmm. all of that stuff but yeah clean term sheets clean no structure to deals always the best place to be don't want to over dilute too early again find balance but always know in the in your back pocket you can sort of negotiate a founder top up for later round investors and that can help heaps yeah super useful cool man i guess like on that whole so we've kind of gone through the journey of like that that fundraising that first fundraising round i guess overall for that first round like the pre-seed or seed round is there any other just like high level kind of pieces of advice or things you would mention to founders i think a lot of i guess like the advice that i'd have is very much just keep doing your homework continuously be meticulous about your business understand every nook and cranny of what you're building and and make sure that it all flows is quite sequential and all of that stuff you just have to think quite intricately intricately mm-hmm. about your business especially in this current environment where the macroeconomic conditions are tough but there's more competition in the world than ever before mm-hmm. and from my perspective never great to have any competition but very hard to have none mm-hmm. and so it's important to understand your business fundamentals it's it's astonishing how many founders don't really have much commercial sense about how to attract revenue, what the levers are in their business that they can pull to sort of bring in revenue, to, to sort of create stickiness and all of that stuff. And a lot of people think that's a product sense, but not necess- it, it, not, it isn't really product mm. vision, product thinking and all of that stuff. It's actually just commercial sense. And mm. you need to be able to develop that over time. You don't need it from day zero, but there needs to be improvement there if you're going to build a really massive business. Got it. Yeah, amazing. And I guess, you know, obviously, like you are an investor uh, with Ramsan Venture Fund. So, you know, I'd just like be really curious, like for you personally, like, I guess what kind of gets you excited? Like if you get a pitch deck and you something comes through or you speak to a founder, like personally for yourself, like what are you really excited? side of bar if someone wanted to get your attention as a founder what should they really think about i think the most interesting thing for me is just how innovation manifests itself in different ways so we're currently you know in a pretty interesting time with ai and all of the product innovation there right but actually the stuff i think is there is some hype to it some things are overrated and products aren't as good as they claim to be And so we're seeing a lot of churn from that perspective. And so you actually have to think about where else you can innovate in your business beyond just product because product can be copied. And like I said, it's a competitive competitive time. It's easier to build product and all of that stuff, right? So when you think about innovation, it's for the longest period of time, the SaaS business model has existed as it is. It's a great recurring revenue business model, right? With AI, there's a lot more usage-based stuff that exists and maybe SaaS the, the SaaS business model doesn't give you the margins that you require to actually scale a software business, right? So I think business model innovation is something that really is underrated and actually very interesting. How Like the thinking around how you can go into an incumbent industry and actually just like use a different business model, think about the incentives of your product and actually craft something from scratch is actually quite fascinating. And I think that goes to my point around having commercial sense you're able to play around with your business model and think about the incentives clearly and find an opportunity that's where real innovation actually is in this current period of time that's what gets me excited that's been that's that's awesome well yeah, there's a lot of things i wanted to talk to you about but we've sort of been we're sort of coming up on time pretty soon so i might sort of look to wrap up here but maybe just a few quick rapid fire questions to, sure. to kind of close this out you got like a favorite book or like all-time favorite resource of, of some sort of writing favorite book Business-wise, I think zero to one, pretty stock standard or poor Charlie's Al- Almanac. Mm. Those are, t- are two of my favorites. Yeah. Nice. They're both good ones. And what do you do for fun outside of work? Play a lot of sport. 
play a lot of racket sports, squash, tennis, table tennis, all of that stuff. But yeah, I like I said before, I've faced periods of burnout. So I just try and meet a lot of my friends by playing sport. Yeah, And it's so good as well, because I guess it's the complete opposite of your work where you're in your head all day and then you go into your body. And so it's a nice kind exactly. of Exactly. Getting out of the room helps a lot. Yeah. And yeah, what's coming up next for you in um, particular? Or what Yeah, so... Like? So there's a few like interesting projects that I want to really push ahead with over the next sort of couple of months, very much like doubling down on that fundraising blueprint that we've sort of spoken about and seeing like actually writing articles about some of the really underrated slash semi-boring stuff about fundraising. They're not necessarily good articles from a view or like virality perspective, but I think it's just important information for people to note. So there's a few things that I've got in my mind around that. Outside of that, from a personal perspective, I'm getting married next year. And so right. there's a lot of prep work for that. Yeah, that's just taking time, which is actually like a really fun process. Yeah, nice. Exciting. And yeah, anything else I haven't asked you or just anything you really want to pass on to the audience before we finish on? Yeah, I mean, like I'm pretty open to talking to anyone about any of this stuff, whether it's investing or fundraising or even just like startup operations and all of that stuff. So feel free to reach me on on LinkedIn, Twitter. My email is abhi, A-B-H-I at rampersand.com. Like always keen to have a chat. Yeah, so cool. yeah, don't feel scared to reach out. Awesome. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And I'll make sure we link link up all your, your details in, in the show notes and also link to Superflu because again, Abby, I think, you know, I've really enjoyed reading all the, the content you put out and I think it's, it's just such a phenomenal resource because again, I think you're very good at taking a very like opaque and kind of a lot of data and sort of like concisely like putting it down into its key points and distilling it which i think is like really useful and you know if i was a founder that was going through a first time fundraise that would be an absolute gold mine to to look through through superfluid so again i'll make sure we link that up and yeah thank you for, for producing the content thank you for coming on the show and really appreciate your time today no thank you for having me you're far too kind